Welcome, everybody, to the Tech Meme Ride Home Experience for Wednesday, May 11th, 2022. We have a very exciting guest in a very strange uh, and challenging moment, I suppose, in the tech world. Um, Eric Newcomer is here, and we're going to be talking about whether it is game over in the tech world. Brian? Uh, yes, I said it. I said to Eric just a minute ago, uh, Eric uh, writes the uh, newcomer Substack, which um, is you know a must read for me for covering sort of exactly the space we're about to talk about. Um, and the uh, I, I think I Chris didn't I um, put this one in the long reads last week, right? The, it's called yes. the end game. Yes, the text uh, it, down. Uh, the end game or game? Uh, I think the image is game over, but I think you're right. I think it's the, at the end game. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the tech downturn persists, forcing startups to grapple with reality. Hey, by the way, NASDAQ was down another 3% today or whatever. Um, okay, Eric, I think the way that we could do this is let, let's start with the stock market first because it's almost like going down the funnel. We can, we can talk about like what that has to do with everything else down to like, you know, someone starting a company today. So uh, right. my, first, my, my first question would be, by the way, thanks for coming on. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, do you have a theory for why now, why the apocalypse now, or at least the apocalypse since November? Yeah. Hey, I, I mean, yeah, set the table. I mean, the NASDAQ composite, which reflects a lot of tech stocks, you know, down 3% in one day, down 11% in five days, down 15% a month, down 28% in six months. You know, we've just been steadily going down. Uh, I think what's amazing about this moment is that, you know, it's falling because interest rates are going up. You know, it's not, it wasn't the global pandemic that killed us. You know, we saw uh, stocks fall off around February, bottomed out in March of 2020. You know, we had this sort of head fake uh, stock market crash, but then we actually entered boom time and it was a great moment to be investor. And now sort of, <laughs> coming out of the pandemic, but with inflation and interest rates, I think interest rates being key going up, you know, right. there, there's a sudden shift, uh, turn against, uh, equities and particularly sort of speculative equities, like, the technology or, 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 or risky, facing. risky assets, full stop. And, and, and right. am I misremembering this? Like the first sort of real headlines about inflation being at 30 year highs that was right at the beginning of the year right like, like so it, if you if you draw the line to that it's it's not really mysterious right i mean and i you know it's you know inflation and rising interest rates are obviously intertwined interest rates need to go up to combat uh inflation you know inflation has a complicated relationship with the stock market but interest rates you know Higher interest rates provide a clear alternative to investing in stocks. Why, why invest in an uncertain stock if you know you're going to be able to get sort of a guaranteed rate of return from an interest rate? So that pushes the stock market to behave, you know, just to behave more conservatively, and has has investors sort of flee flee equities. So, so that's sort of what it's going what's going on on the most fundamental level. Um, okay, so. Getting to sort of my funnel thing. Um, so right now, what we've seen is sort of like a, someone who, who, who turned me on to this, um, a sassacre. Um, sort of, <laughs> sort of Ooh, like that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And wait, I, I'll, I'll have to figure out who, who did that because it, it is good. But it, it is. Uh, I've said on the show even today, I think um, that it, it's it is a lot of the companies that went public the last. I don't know, let's say five years or so. So this generation of companies of which there were a lot of SaaS, a lot of, um, I don't know, dev tools and things like that, but um, high growth companies that um, showed growth on the uh, top line, but not the bottom line, right? Um, and so people were giving them on, on the public markets, insane multiples. Right. Uh, well, like and, Snowflake has been one of the hottest. Okay, dude, stocks. I'm so glad you said that. Is my theory is is Snowflake like literally the emblematic company <laughs> of this period? Oh, uh, Snowflake is down 65 percent over six months, 59 year to date, and 7.5 percent today. I my take, I just think it's, 
I think SaaS comes first. It's easiest for the market to reprice SaaS companies because there's such a historical truth, right? I mean, you can just, you can easily compare them to each other. You know what sort of the historic rates have been. You know, we had this sort of delusionary period where people thought maybe the multiples for SaaS companies would be forever changed, but then it doesn't seem like the case. So it's just, it's much easier for SaaS companies to reset. So we've seen those fall, you know, more, you know, more than I think we've seen, you know, like a Tesla or sort of like the sort of, you know, uh, electric vehicles or other sort of speculative sectors potentially falling. Um, so I think there's still time for for it to play out. It can translate from the things where investors know how to reprice them to areas where people, <laughs> well, I mean, we saw with Coinbase today, you know, people waiting for earnings or other signals to, to send the price uh, down. Mm. Well, so sticking with the funnel analogy, um, you know, I, 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 my assumption is is that sixty to seventy percent of the listeners to this podcast uh, work for startups or work in the tech industry. As right, we got VCs say. in some some yeah. messaging yeah. me as we speak. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm seeing other friends in the room as well too. Um, but so number one, what what is uh, Noah Smith was tweeting today about like talking to friends and, and seeing their compensation expectations for this year being halved and things like that. So number one, for the people listening, uh, if you're working at a public uh, tech company, you know, even Apple is approaching down 30%, I think, from its high. So uh, the question is, whether, whether the people that are sitting on stock options that could be underwater right now, what does this do for um, folks? Because, okay, l- l- let me rephrase it a different way. Um, you know, there's a podcast that I listen to that says, like, the, the Greenspan put is over, and that's the problem for the larger market where, you know, um, stop, because because interest rates were so low for so long, stocks were so cheap, and, and, and tech stocks led that way. Um, and so investors don't know, aren't used to stocks going down. But I've thought all this week about employees at tech companies will be facing for the first time in at least a decade, maybe 15 years, the idea that their options would be underwater. So, right. Uh, well, what, what would you, somebody yeah. was tweeting, you know, if a startup doesn't give you an extension they're basically saying like screw you you know you're uh you're not that's my equity now you know this company's keeping it because it's hard to justify paying for it i mean i don't know it's gonna have to play out play out we're gonna have to see how many layoffs there are you would think there would be some advantage you know to public companies in that they reset valuation expectations overnight in the way we're going to see private companies in denial about their lower expectations. You know, I love to talk about just sort of the Databricks versus Snowflake comparison. I mean, Snowflake has been able, you know, <laughs> it's painfully suffered a falling uh, market cap, but at least that means, you know, if you join the company, you know, your stock grant is updated. Whereas, you know, a company like Databricks, you might sort of get a compensation based on a illiquid private valuation that was assigned in in the boom boom times i mean we saw instacart reset but we haven't really seen sort of many public announcements of large private unicorns resetting their 409a valuations so yeah definitely employee you know people going to new companies are going to have to decide whether it makes sense to to go to a private unicorn that raised a super high up round last year Right, because there was a shit ton of that. Um, like you even said in your piece that, like you know, it was not uncommon last year for companies to raise twice in a year, three times in right. a year. That that <laughs> right. cadence has got to be over. Um, right, but so hopefully the companies, have, you know, have right. money. Right, I mean there was money to be had. So I do think it'll take a while. You know, if people think this is some, you know, the end of the world. Uh, you know, when will we actually see, I think, you know, SPAC companies, when we talk about this later, are sort of maybe the earlier bankruptcy sort of mm. candidates, whereas the mm-hmm. unicorns, you know, I think are pretty well capitalized. And there's more of a question of whether they just sort of aren't, aren't you know, have sort of that, if you remember the Dropbox 10 billion period where they just lived under sort of the cloud of their 
really high valuation for a long time and it made them sort of less sexy than they wanted to be. Right. So if, if you're a company that managed to raise, let's say $400 million last year, in theory, if you did it right, that should get you, you know, enough runway that you could maybe, uh, eke this out. But the other problem would be if you didn't do enough and you did raise at a, at a really high valuation, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to pull that out again. So like you said in your piece that like, um, down rounds are, are, are coming and are probably healthy, right? Yeah. I mean, somebody, somebody said to me, you know, what great companies will have flat rounds and good companies will have down rounds, but that's going to take time. You know, I think right now we're still in this sort of, why would I do either if I have plenty of money? If you don't, yeah, I think we're going to see, I mean, Companies can always like extend their round, basically take new money at the old price, which feels less painful, even though you would think, you know, with hopefully improved metrics, uh, you should be able to raise a higher price. You can't because the market's corrected. So you, so you just extend or yeah, you have to raise a down round, but that might not be, I don't know. We might not see big, interesting down rounds till the end of this year or something because companies are mm. capitalized enough. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's not, Like, I don't think we've seen a lot of, like, private down rounds yet. I mean, more we're seeing layoffs and people trying to manage costs. Um, And we're seeing up rounds. You know, I I do think the crazy thing, uh, uh, Logan at uh, Red Point said to me, basically, you know, the, the beauty of the private markets is that, you know, as long as somebody's drinking, you know, the bar stays open. You know, with the idea where the private markets are sort of an auction-based system, as long as there are people, investors willing to pay a high price on the private markets, you know, sort of the party goes on. And, yeah, that there's a truth to that. I think we saw, I mean, Rippling raised, announced a raise today um, at a higher valuation. Uh, Deal announced, I think it was like a $12 billion valuation. So we're seeing companies... SaaS companies on the private markets still raise these sort of opportunistic up rounds. Well, and so, okay, that's, that's the final third of the funnel here, which would be companies that haven't raised yet companies at the seed stage or whatever. And, and, and you and I DM'd about this earlier this week where I'm like, there's still some big valuations out there in the seed and pre-seed things that, that, that I'm seeing, but like, I, Here's my thing. Would I feel like right now it would be more perilous to be a company that had raised a big D or E round, but then know that they probably can't go public for a while than to be a seed or an A company where everyone expects that you still have years and years and years to go. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, okay. first of all, the valuations reset working backwards from the public markets. So you're, you're the worst if you're a pre-IPO round, and you're the best if you're a seed round. Um, I think there's also just still a continued belief. I mean, everybody still believes in the technology sector <laughs> that it produces interesting companies. I mean, uh, the downturn will have to continue, and we'll have to suffer through it a long time till we have more people say, I don't believe in it. So given that, people are willing to make sort of risky bets on seed and Series A companies, because those valuations are more just like, uncertainty of the company not clearly rooted in you know the ma- it's it's not clear what like the correct series a multiple for a SaaS company is right i mean it's sort of the market decides so those seed and series a remain super frothy hard to say what the perfect valuation is for those companies driven by the market um given by what people will pay but i mean uh pre-ipo rounds you know it's much easier to say like I could just buy Salesforce. Why do I? Why would I invest in you? This is their growth rate and size. This is yours. So it becomes much harder to sort of cover your eyes and ears and and invest anyway. What do you What do you think this means for? I guess maybe product development, making risky bets. It feels like this is going to require a lot more discipline from companies. And you look at other companies that maybe have like one idea or were trying to, for example, capitalize on the Amazon one click patent expiring, like Bolt and Fast. <laughs> right. And 
I'm trying to understand like, what is the real lesson here? Like, because it feels like in some cases, like the emperors really had no clothes and what they were building on just wasn't really going to turn into an actual business versus an overall correction in the broader macro economic trends with inflation and with interest rates and with a kind of, as you say, correcting or maybe redistribution of where people are seeing upside um, or, or upside potential. And, you know, later stage startups, um, you know, or series D, E, F, whatever companies are less attractive because the upside over the next several years is, as you said, like a less or some more risky bet. Right. I mean, Dara Rashai at Uber, I think, was smart and got out sort of ahead on this and wrote a letter basically being, you know, saying that the market was going to shift to wanting cash flows and away from speculative right. bets. Right. I mean, that sort of fit the evolution he's been trying to do at Uber anyway. So a good message. But, but yeah, I do think there's a truth that, you know, there was just this sort of grow, grow, grow. I mean, I wrote late last year about Rivian going public, I called it a horseman of the apocalypse. I mean, just the yep. sort of raw <laughs> sort of, I mean, there, you know, there was just a lot of bullishness around that company when it had like no revenue, you know, no proven track record of producing things at scale, which is what car companies uh, do. And, you know, now, yeah, that stock is, is being punished. Um, I mean, product within new companies, I think, you know, it's much easier if you, if you're generating cash flow, right? If you're a business that's actually proven that it, you can survive without the outside capital, then you you know you can make this trade off between coming up with new products and yeah, I think that's what I what I wonder about in this flow. moment. You know, right. like whether it's I Airbnb it's, or Uber, right. you know, where they have like, you know, real businesses and, you know, something of a moat versus a lot of these SaaS companies, which are quite virtual and possibly replaceable. Like they were providing a convenience, you know, maybe like a, a vitamin. Well, and also a might, half of their business might be selling to other startups as well. Exactly. Right. Also. Well, that's right. a huge problem. I mean, yeah. Airbnb, I think the Airbnb Uber contrast is a good one. I just think that people, the, the investor world believes that Airbnb will stay stay around. You know, that that's like a business model that makes sense, is good, and, and so much of its brand is predicated on, like, product innovation. So it's hard for me to see a world where Airbnb, you know, we just saw them roll out sort of their big updates, I think, right. this week. T today, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that makes sense. It's so much their brand. I don't know. I, I don't know that there's so much fear that you're going to say Airbnb shouldn't be doing that. But I, I do think just given the historic skepticism of on demand and this sort of blitz scaling world that Uber represents just like Uber being able to say we are cash flow positive is just like a very clear answer and getting to that point just reassures you know skeptics and you know it's just like what well, answers that you, question you can if anybody say has we, it in we the back live of their on minds. our own well yeah. it answers the question if anybody has it in the back of their mind like when is this thing going to be solvent essentially <laughs> Right, exactly. It's like if, if you know that you have the you are going to produce the money to stay alive, that's like reassuring <laughs> to people. So I I do think there's a big there's a big difference between companies that are like, "Oh, how do I manage how much cash I show?" Mm. versus like companies where you're like, you know, like a Rivian or something where you're like, "How will you ever, you know, what is the path?" Th mm -hmm. Those are really different situations and these companies that don't the investors can't even sort of figure out how you would get to profitability are going to have a lot of problems because you can't just say, well, the revenue yeah. is growing, <laughs> going to grow so much. You know? So actually we have, uh, Logan is up on stage, uh, who's quoting oh, your piece. I thought yes. he might chime in actually. You can't get anyone to agree on anything these days. So when UBS, Deloitte and city all say something, I listen. Recently, they all published reports highlighting an unexpected asset class. It has nothing to do with NFTs, Bitcoin, or anything like that. Shockingly, they all believe fine art is an investable financial asset. And you know what? I agree. In fact, I've invested in art with Masterworks, the revolutionary fintech platform. Here's why. Contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. City also reported art had the lowest correlation to stocks of any major asset asset class. Plus, it's just cool to own a piece of some really famous art. But adding this asset class to your portfolio used to cost millions of dollars and lots of time until Masterworks changed the game. 
Thanks to them, you can become a bona fide art investor in minutes. If you want to join me and 340,000 other early adopters, just go to masterworks.io slash ride for priority access. That's masterworks.io slash ride. See you all there. See important regulation A disclosures at masterworks.io slash about slash disclosure. When you do anything in life, there's one way to do it, and then there's maybe a smarter way to do it. You might already be investing in cryptocurrency, but did you know you can trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and over 80 other cryptocurrencies in a tax-advantaged IRA? With an Alto Crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Alto's Crypto IRA is the easy way to get crypto into an IRA, trade all you want without the tax headaches, create an account in just a few minutes, invest with as little as $10. There are no setup charges and no account fees. Secure trading is possible 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. And over 150 coins are available, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. There are multiple ways to fund your account. You could make a cash contribution, transfer cash from an existing IRA, or roll over an old 401k. If you're ready to take your investments to the next level, diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA with as little as $10. Just go to altoira.com slash techmeme. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash techmeme. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira.com slash techmeme. Logan, how many points of yours have I already stolen compared to it as mine? Uh, I actually had to sign off uh, when you were talking about it. I, I, did, I accidentally requested to speak uh, when, when I heard some snowflake slander going on. Exactly. I'm not slandering them. I'm no, not you. Not you. Uh, Chris was slandering snowflake, so I had to jump no, in. No, it was probably me. It was Brian. probably me. Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian. Logan, do you want to just introduce yourself, introduce yeah, yourself sure. briefly? So, uh, Logan, uh, I'm a uh, partner on the growth fund here at Redpoint uh, Red Venture and uh, spend too much time on Twitter and, and paying attention to all these market stuff and joking about it. And uh, I, I spoke to Eric last week about everything that was sort of going on. And so I, uh, I think I was featured in his, uh, in his piece. And it sounds like someone texted me, quoted, while I, was, uh, while I had to answer a phone call and do actual work. Yes. The, I mean, do you, one question we were asking, you're like an expert on SaaS. I mean, do you, do you think SaaS is going to come out of this the worst or you think SAS it's just clear now I was sort of defending SAS a little bit but like are you worried SAS is really going to get caught out here or you think SAS is going to do well relative to other parts of tech in this downturn yeah well I was I was joking that like SAS uh um that it's not the bottom until someone like fundamentally questions SAS business model uh (laughs) like if that's actually a sustainable (laughs) business model or not so that's when we'll know at the bottom is like some prominent investor coming out and being like I don't know about the SAS thing uh, I well, think that, I did. I did ask about like we don't know about the stickiness of SaaS in a real terrible market yet. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, certain types of SaaS, I would agree. Right, but right. I feel like you know, both through the pandemic as well as the recession, there were at least some SaaS businesses out there. I do think there's probably some stuff that like exists out of the core HRIS, but. I think, unfortunately, software is replaced and become intertwined in so many ways. With uh, it's really a trade-off between uh, labor, capex, and opex, right. right? And I think the operating expense ultimately wins, unfortunately, in most of these situations. And so, I think SaaS in the situations that you can find will often be picked over, you know, certainly capital. And <laughs> you're saying you're you're getting fired before they get rid of the software. Uh, well, <laughs> lay off, lay the, the proverbial view. Yeah, but yeah. I, I heard, Eric, I heard a little bit of what you were saying that, like, I agree. I mean, SAS 1 has, like, whatever, 78 or 72 or 65 or 80, like, different data points, right? And the business model is fairly understood and consistent. Like, gross margins hover between, you know, 50% and 80%. Uh, like you have the spectrum of free cash flow and all of that stuff. And so if you look, I mean, honestly, like has SaaS been hit? Yes, but it's really just a proxy for high growth, right? And uh, and so like Box hasn't been uh, hit in the same way that, um, I, you know, whatever uh, Cloudflare has, for example. And so it's like the, the companies that exist on the more in the orientation to high growth. I mean, if you think about what's going on, right, what, what had happened over the last couple of years is a discounting back of projected growth and free cash flow when interest rates were where they were. 
And so now that you have these companies that are hit, you know, growing at 90%, 100%, you are really projecting a, a meaningful uh, growth rate in these companies going forward. And so the discount back when the interest rate changes, it hits these companies particularly hard. Right. right. And so I mean, the I big question more, go ahead. to me, just like to really zoom out beyond SaaS and everything is just, is this going to be mostly a valuation problem or is there some correlated reason that like the revenue these companies expected to grow is is not going to grow at the same rate right like is there and i mean some there's certainly the argument and i think we've alluded to this that businesses that sell to startups <laughs> when it's less yes. appealing to be a startup that we can see some correlated uh revenue problems there but do you see other problems tricking trickling out I've besides just sort of multiple correction I've yet to see it uh, in, in the portfolio and in my companies. Like I, I think someone, maybe Primac or someone, was talking recently about uh, about like what's going on in some of the softness in Q1, and I, I don't know why that would be the case for most of these companies. Now, if you sell to startups, I certainly understand that. If you have business in Russia or the Ukraine, I understand <laughs> that. If you have things associated with like I don't know global supply chain or inflation index stuff, like I understand that. But like at a fundamental level, this seems like a valuation question, and these businesses are fundamentally healthy, right? right. Now, if we if we find our way into a recession, um, then that's obviously going to be different. But right now, it seems like it's just a valuation question, and that certainly has implications for employees and stuff. But I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen the indication that we're headed into a recession and buying cycles are going to change, at least in my portfolio. But I'm also could not I, a macro prognosticator. Eric, let, let me step on you real quick. Could, could I throw a theory out there? Um, I'm going to quote you, Eric, uh, in your piece. You're talking about how lofty valuations for delusional companies help drive up valuations for even the most reality-based companies. Certainly, we saw that in the dot-com bubble era, although 97% of the companies in the dot-com bubble were bullshit. But uh, here's my theory. Did the SPAC mania of a year ago bring a bunch of companies to public markets that were garbage? And that has contributed to this idea that it just sours so many, so many investors that they're, they just, they're, they're starting to wash their hands in a similar way. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, to me, I think, I don't think it's that investors are disillusioned in the good companies because there were so many poor performing SaaS companies. I think that there's been a general willingness of investors to del delude themselves about companies and that's being exposed early by, by the SPAC. Sorry, if I said SaaS, I meant SPACs before, but by, by the SPAC, um, Companies. I don't know. I, I think I do think there are a lot of business. I mean, put positively, businesses have been given an extremely long leash to figure things out. I mean, Uber's like cumulative gap net losses was something like twenty three billion dollars. So Uber has been given. I mean, I don't know what that is in cash flow terms, but Uber has given been given many, many, many billions of dollars to figure this thing out and to build a scale to be a huge business and. Uh, I guess there's no reason necessarily that companies should have that that long of a leash, and we might be entering a period where they don't. But what? So does that mean to imply that you think Uber itself just isn't really great no, business I, I and think should Uber's, have had a shorter leash? Uber's been. I mean, will I, I was asking today, like, will Uber make enough money mm -hmm. to justify all the money that was put in? Like mm -hmm. that that question doesn't really have anything to do with how you figure out Uber's like market cap today, it's more of a question of future cash flows. But, but I do think there's this question of, yeah, what, how, how much cash flow can it produce and does it justify how much, how much was invested? I mean, I think Uber's got to the other side of, I mean, they're much more precarious businesses than Uber. I mean, like go puff yeah. better, well, you know, like, these are we, have, we have a favorites. whole next generation. We have right. a whole sort of segment of companies that are like, Uber wasn't risky enough, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, uh, that I, I don't want to pick on Uber before I'm criticizing. No, but, but, but I think it's, it's a really interesting, you know, I, yeah. I guess, point, like relatively speaking. 
because after Uber, right, the, like Uber almost set the bar for a certain type of aggressiveness and growth at all costs and just grow, grow, grow and burn money, you know, like a mofo. And the next generation of startups came up, came up after that with almost like an imperative to go even harder and go even faster, which in some ways is kind of how we got fast and, and bolt and those guys. So. Right. Like, what is the lesson that startups that are either starting now, you know, will take away from this or for startups that let's say are one or two or three years in and, you know, we're pursuing that strategy and suddenly, you know, the jet fuel is, is, you know, no longer available for their planes, you know, which were just little tinker toys. And now they're like, oh my God, like we are, you know, sort of, we haven't achieved escape velocity yet. What do we do? How do we weather this? I mean, this is going to be pretty scarring for a generation of startups, is it not? Yeah, I mean, if you want to build a super cash-intensive uh, company, you might have missed uh, the best window in yeah. history for it. Um, I mean, just I mean, just if you think about the availability of capital, I mean, there are questions about how much Tiger has to invest in private companies. Mm-hmm. SoftBank is yep. super chased. Like, you just look at the okay, pools okay, of wait, capital. Wait. I am going to interrupt again. Because yeah, jump in there. Yeah, because, okay, right, I did the story on Tiger, uh, it was yesterday, I think it was, or was it today? I can't remember. It's like an IO today was, was crazy. Um, but, but in the same way that smart companies were raising as much money as they could over the last 18 months, um, huge VC raises were happening. I mean, the biggest we've ever seen. Right. Everybody loaded up. So on the one hand, there's no reason to think – that the money's going to dry up, right? Because that has to be deployed somewhere. I don't see the startup ecosystem, like the the, the the supply of startups drying up. Like I know after the dot-com bubble, like there were funds that returned money to investors because they literally said there were no companies to invest in. I don't see that happening. And so right. all of those raises yeah, yeah, yeah. are going to have to go somewhere, right? Well, first of all, I mean, Logan and his competitors have lots of money. I mean, there's still a ton. Andreessen has raised a ton of money. I mean, Lightspeed was working on a big fund. You know, they're just all all these multi-stage, you know, traditional venture funds are super well capitalized. I mean, some of them have invested a bunch, but they've raised a bunch. They can slow the pace down. Yeah, I, I still think, you know, <laughs> there's just so much money that the startup world as as we know it is definitely continuing in the sort of hardcore engineering companies are going to keep raising money and like, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> uh, covering tech. I was very young during dot com, but I, I don't think it's sort of the, I'm not saying like nothing's good. I mean, I'm defending SAS. I, I think there are lots of compelling businesses. I just think the long leash of like burn unlimited yeah. capital because I mean, burn unlimited capital because there's almost a demand for capital to invest. Like your right. capital inefficiency is almost a strength because we need to deploy capital and you burn right. it. You know, yep. like exactly. that's the environment we've been in. And it, it does feel like there's a move against that. Right. Again, I want to stress because there's a lot of investors on the stage here. Like we're, none of us are saying it's garbage and things are going to shit. We're, we're, we're trying to see to what degree <laughs> things are going to shit. Right. Um, uh, yeah, on how big is this of, correction going to be? Right, and right. I definitely and get like very serious investors text me, text me like this is dot com, <laughs> you know. Like, mm, so they're mm, definitely huh. the investors, you know, know that professionally they're public optimists, but in in the DMs, you know, there are people <laughs> who are very fearful. Can I they're ask you, uh, the sheets. Eric? Are you? Uh, and I'm sure Logan probably wouldn't want to speak to this, but he can if he wants to. Um, is there LP pullback to the to the folks that you're talking about? By which I mean for people listening. Um, the, the, the VCs, uh, have to get money from their limited partners. And if, if what's happening is people are de-risking from assets, um, are VCs seeing that happen from, from the LP side? That is the question I would like to answer. I mean, it, it's hard, you know, it's harder well, to would, know. Let, let me, let me, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, actually, I mean, Let's just do it in in terms of pure math. Like LPs have targets associated with private companies or private uh, funds, right? And so if I'm an endowment and I want to be 10% in venture, right, that's going to be a target of, hey, I'm going to try to get to 10% of venture. And that could be, you know, whatever. If you're 
If you're Harvard, that means you have a uh, $1 trillion endowment, and of that trillion, you know, $100 billion is going to go to venture, right? If the rest is, or let's say 30% is in the public markets, well, now that 30% uh, percent has been cut in large part, right? I don't know if it's in half or if it's by a third or if it's by two thirds or what, whatever it is. It sort of depends. And so now the basket of stuff you have on the private markets has gone from a target of 10%. Now you're at 14% or 16% or 18% or whatever it is, right? And so when one side of the water balloon gets squeezed, then you know the other side gets impacted. And so inevitably, there's going to be a pullback from LPs, right? And so it could just be, hey, they're going to borrow from the real estate portion or from whatever, their illiquid portions. Or it could be that they got to the number they wanted to. They wanted to be at you know 10% in the next three years, and they got to 10% be just by the other part of it squeezing, or it could be they need to cut managers, right? And so my thesis is it's going to be some of all of that. And you're going to see a lot of like the the mid managers that have delivered really good returns because they've been indexed to software or internet or, you know, some of these businesses and they got out at good times are going to struggle to raise just because uh, of this effect, right? The supply and the demand effect. And you've also been compounded with you know, Eric alluded to some of the names, but a bunch of people raising huge funds that has uh, dried up coffers as well. And so I, I think this is going to have a material impact on uh, GP's ability to fundraise. One thing that we haven't actually talked about yet is crypto and whether or not there's a different type of exposure or, you know, you, you think that money is going over in that direction. There's been a number of startup companies that have also bought into crypto. Does well, that and by the way, as of, as of yeah, as recently ahead. as this week, the big raises mm -hmm. have been still in crypto. So mm -hmm. just yep. food for thought there, but. Yeah. Crypto is hard because, uh, hard this is uh, hard to know the fundamental bottom to it right i mean that's sort of that's right. that's that's sort of part of what we were talking about in the SaaS conversation um you know there have been so many times you know i spent uh what many many years in the early 2010s being skeptical of crypto so i think a lot of people uh have watched booms and busts and have learned to measure their words a little bit but i mean certainly what like nfts have been blown out i mean the currencies mm -hmm. are all way down the stable coins are in crisis yep. like big time. definitely big big problems in crypto world and yeah i mean the crypto funds I, that's basically where i've been reporting for the last couple of months have have been the thing that for a while was saving you know venture venture was sort of worried end of the year uh, slower early this year, but the crypto funds were well capitalized and sort of deploying and Ethereum was doing better than Bitcoin. You know, there were always sort of different things happening. Um, but now, <laughs> yeah, uh, Bitcoin, which is supposed to be a hedge, uh, against the world, uh, imploding, you would think is not performing as such. And so it's just very hard to know what the bottom is, uh, for crypto and, Presumably, firms like Andreessen and Paradigm are just going to continue to deploy as true believers and believe they're getting good prices. But, you know, a lot of people who are just sort of onlookers are going to chicken out and leave the market. Uh, Eric or Logan, what do you make about the fact, again, as I've said this week on the show, that crypto is almost one to one correlated not just to the stock market, not just to the NASDAQ, but to the specific sort of companies we're talking about, like the Shopify's, the SaaS's. Um, does, what do you make of that? Because it, to me, it, it makes it feel like they're all in the same basket of sort of like the, the sort of um, Wall Street bets style investing. Do, do you feel like that, that that's true? I mean, clearly it's sort of... <laughs> actually true at the moment i mean i don't know i'm sure there's some crypto person who's they they analyze the correlations uh a bazillion different ways but but yeah i mean if i had to mount a defense for that it would just be you know the audience of people who are early believers in and crypto and these stocks are, are similar but in the long term you know different sets of people would invest in them but yeah certainly i think i agree with you that the reality uh at the moment has been that those two things are very intertwined. Um, 
this is moving backwards slightly, but uh, under normal circumstances, like some of these depressed public companies at this point would be leading to acquisitions, which seems to kind of be impossible for the the usual suspects at this point because of the regulatory environment right now. Like I, I'm thinking of like you know a Shopify approaching like a forty billion dollar valuation, which there's no way Amazon could take them out or whatever. But like there's others that are like you know ten billion dollars, twelve billion dollars, and so um, do you expect to see some sort of movement towards M and A to some of these low flyers? Um, I mean, shit, uh, Peloton could get so low. All of those rumors of Amazon and even Apple would make sense if they're down <laughs> so far that they're on the pink sheets or something. $5. But, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, I was talking to Rick Heitzman at First Mark on my podcast, Dead Cat. And he was basically, yeah, he was saying that he thought there would be a lot of small acquisitions. Definitely the sort of the cleanup, you know, startup finally admits it's multiple isn't what it wanted. And like a smaller company buys a tiny company. I mean, it feels like on the big side, the regulatory problems persist. So that's been super hard. I mean, you know, you could see just sort of, you know, these, the mega caps are, are still so large that, you know, and, and very savvy about where technology is headed that you could imagine them buying sort of, non-competitive businesses just you know uh what well microsoft bought linkedin right in a similar sort of moment of market panic and that's been a great investment uh you could see sort of even more sort of unrelated businesses getting scooped up by big tech that just believes in them um but definitely it's a hard time to buy a business that uh you know is competitive with you Logan, yeah, I think, I, mean, I think we're going to see it takes a recalibration. So in the private markets, like if you raised in December 2021, you think you're still worth that. And maybe the CEO and the executive team are saying like, OK, we raised it a billion. But in today's dollars, we might only be worth 300 or 400 or 500 or whatever. But like all the rank and file employees and the board members, uh, depending on the growth rate, still sort of think they're worth a billion dollars. And maybe maybe if you gave them truth serum, they wouldn't actually say that. But they're still anchored around that price. If you look at the public company CEOs, like they, they're forced on an hourly basis to, to reckon with the fact that they're not worth what they were worth in December, right? They're not even worth what they were worth two weeks ago. And so at some point when the either people are going to look for life rafts, right, like now and think it's going to get worse and say, hey, you know, forget whatever we were priced at in December or January. Let's get out if we can get out where we were priced at three weeks ago, right? I don't think that's a big group of people. I think that's just like hard from a psychological standpoint. But when it ultimately, when you spend a month or two months within a certain band of pricing, I'm sure, you know, Catalyst, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, phones are going to be ringing off the hook in June, July, August, where, you know, you've already seen it with Anaplan got out and uh, the Toma Bravo, Bravo, and, you know, there's been rumors of Zendesk. And I imagine we're going to see a bunch of those companies trade the, private equity and potentially a Salesforce or an Adobe or some of those on the B2B side. On the consumer side, I don't know what you do. Like I, I think any of the logical acquirers, it's probably not worth the headache for them to buy any of these businesses, except for Microsoft, which somehow is like the Teflon Don out there. <laughs> so ironically. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to give Eric the chance to uh, exit um, if he would like to. Um, he's he's met his, his quota for time, if he, he would like. <laughs> but also, um, please I, plug. Uh, you well, yeah, stick I, I have one more question. Want, plug one more question, and then um, Eric can stay or go. Um, sure. My question is, is thinking about maybe the end of Q2. Um, you know, it's it's relatively soon, but not that far away. Um, what do you what do you think is going to happen between now and then? Like, what are you sort of expecting? You know, are we going to see a continuous you know drawdown through the rest of the year, the rest of the quarter? Um, like, do you have any predictions on what we should expect and sort of brace for, or is it going to like level off? That's a very dangerous uh, question. <laughs> I I won't make any predictions about uh, sort of the stock market. Sure. Falling. I mean, I guess I wouldn't be surprised. It, it feels like there's still like tons of shoes to drop here. I don't know. I I feel like are there certain areas or verticals or kind of sized well, companies? Well, the big the, the big investors that are sort of like 
really sort of over the barrel on this, like what happens to them, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the startups that are really cash dependent when the world is sour, like what happens to them? And then, and the SPACs, I mean, this, (laughs) we haven't talked a lot about them because Silicon Valley tries to hold them at arm's length, but if some of the SPACs like go bankrupt and if bankruptcies all of a sudden seem like a real possibility and not a thing that uh, annoying cynical reporters like wonder about, then is there sort of more general fear? So to me, there's a lot of worry. People are losing money, but it seems like there's still plenty of apocalypse uh, that could be ahead of us. Okay. So the bloodbath will continue. Um, Eric, if you do want to bow out. Um, yes. You... Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. People can read my stuff on newcomer.co. It's a sub stack. Uh, subscribe. I'm going to keep covering all these themes and yeah, I have my own podcast, Dead Cat, where we are very interested in these topics as well. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks for stopping by. Um, I've right, also, cool. so oh, he just he vanished and Logan too, if you want to stick around, um, or if you want to prom- promote anything now is also uh, an opportunity for you. Sure. I mean, every, every person that uh, gets behind a microphone has to have a podcast. So I have, it, right. you know, if people want to click into that, it's on my bio and, uh, yeah, thanks for accidentally having me. Well, and, and, but by the way, Logan, we're, we're reposting this on the tech meme podcast. So please tell us what it is. Cause it's a great podcast. Uh, sorry, and I love okay. it. Yes. Uh, my podcast is called cartoon avatars. Uh, so, and it's every Saturday morning. Um, this week I, have Aaron Levy on and uh, we're seeing who else, but kind of covering week in tech. So. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks for, for showing up. Um, yeah, we have another time. guest in Logan. If you want to stick around or Eric, you know, by all means um, we have Alex Conrad here and uh, he's the senior editor at Forbes uh, covering VC and tech. So we thought we'd have another perspective uh, given that Alex has been listening uh to the conversation so far. Um, welcome, Alex. If you want to say hello, introduce yourself and let us know what you think. Yeah. Hey, um, Alex Conrad here. Um, am at Forbes as noted, and, um, I've really enjoyed the conversation so far. Uh, lots to think on, not really sure where I would exactly jump in. You may have to call on me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what, here's, here's something that, uh, here's a question that we didn't get to that I'm curious about. Um, but we alluded to it earlier, which was at least so far the last two weeks, the sort of big monster raises have all been um, in crypto. I'm curious if you're hearing or feeling like um, that's sort of the one that's been surviving. That's the sector that's been surviving recently. And if all of a sudden we stop getting the, you know, $300 million crypto round, if, if that will really be a canary in the coal mine, that would uh, be, uh, (laughs) be bad for us. Well, the first thing I would say for anyone listening is, um, you know, there's there's a, a lag with some of these funding rounds, and so because it takes the, months to do to, to close around, yes, yeah. I mean, like I I've been talking to companies about potentially writing about them that raised rounds months ago and weren't announced, so that definitely makes things tougher <laughs> to try to track. Um, mm-hmm. so, th- so there could be big rounds out there that haven't been announced. And it could just be that the crypto folks are the noisiest. Um, <laughs> but that said, I, I mean, I think that there have to be big rounds still coming because there's just so many multi-billion dollar funds that need to deploy some of this capital. Um, you know, so, so I think what, what's probably happening right now in my mind is more of a repricing where companies may not necessarily want to raise a big round at terms that feel much worse than they could have gotten three or six months ago. So I, I think there's probably a bit of a pause there where, you know, I don't want to raise that dilutive big round if I haven't already, but I, I feel like the money has to be deployed. The One of the things, uh, and I, I'm pulling from um, Eric's piece again, so I have to credit him for that. The, the, to me, the biggest question now is whether we're going to see startup valuation multiples contract or if we're actually going to see the fundamentals uh, falter, right? Because, and, and I think, you know, we talked about that maybe, uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes ago. Um, as far as we know, and, and you tell me, Alex, have we, have you been hearing that people's portfolios, that the companies in their portfolios are, are sort of whiffing on metrics and things like that? 
Yeah, you know, I think that um, <laughs> I was just hearing about a company that um, said it would go from 10 to 100 million in revenue and went from 10 to 30, which is in normal times really good for a lot of companies, <laughs> but is not Nobody good knows. if you said you're going to hit 100, right? <laughs> So um, I think that's definitely happening. I also think that um, I was talking to a VC earlier today who is out fundraising and said that, you know, their their LPs seem to kind of be a bit shell-shocked. And so I, I definitely think oh, that... We, we, we talked about that earlier. So you're, you're hearing that there is pullback from LPs. Interestingly enough, I, I was listening to that. I This VC who I literally spoke to today doesn't, like hasn't seen that the results happen yet. And I think Logan's points were really apt, but, but said that just the emotion in the room was not good. <laughs> you know, that, that, the, that the LPs were kind of like, you know, wanted to complain to the VC fund manager. Um, <laughs> like, it, like justify what's happening here in your world. Um, so, so I think that, I think that to, similar to my last point, I don't think that the shoe has dropped yet. We're all kind of in this this in between uh, reshuffling of the chairs. Work uninterrupted, run your business with less stress, and get more leads from your marketing efforts with Smith AI. Smith AI provides businesses with award winning virtual receptionists who handle your calls, chats, and texts to unlock new business at a fraction of the cost of hiring an in house staff. Smith AI is not your average receptionist service. Since 2015, they've combined the best receptionists across North America with AI technology for superior business communications and customer engagement. Their friendly and professional agents can screen leads using your custom criteria, schedule appointments on your calendar, and call back leads who complete your forms. They can do it all by phone seven days a week and also on your website through their 24-7 live chat service. They even answer texts and Facebook messages. Smith AI pays for itself and then some with all the new clients their receptionists help you win. Never miss another lead. Boost revenue, increase your focus at work, and keep your staffing costs down. It's as simple as forwarding your calls to Smith AI. Plans start at just $240 a month. Try Smith AI today. Our listeners will save $100 when you sign up using our promo code TECHMEME at smith.ai. Visit smith.ai to read five-star reviews, and be sure to use our code TECHMEME, T-E-C-H-M-E-M-E, to save $100 at sign up. Don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. Constant Contact is a digital marketing platform that helps small businesses and nonprofits of all sizes build, grow, and succeed. With email marketing, contact management, industry-leading list growth tools, social media ads, and more, Constant Contact helps small businesses connect with customers, find new ones, and sell online, all from one easy-to-use platform. They've been trusted by millions of businesses to help improve their marketing. With a 97% deliverability rate, you can rest assured that your customers and potential customers are are getting the right message at the right time. With a simple interface, Constant Contact's easy-to-use platform makes contact management easier than ever. Their list growth tools help you find a bigger audience fast. Lead generation landing pages, text to join, and social media ads are proven to grow your list and drive engagement with your brand. With thousands of integrations, you can sync Constant Contact's tools with the tools you're already using. Powerful automation tools help you send the right message to the right person at the right time, every time. To start your free digital marketing trial today, visit ConstantContact.com. That's ConstantContact.com. What do you think what is... If, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Brian, but like one of the thoughts that I have is that there's a lot more people who have entered into the VC world, you know, in the last four or five, six years, you know, since the downturn. And so... I would think that the level of skittishness might be just generally higher. And so some of that emotion that you're sort of encountering, you know, might be just due to that, uh, like discrepancy or that dichotomy. And I, I guess I'm asking, you know, if that is reasonable or real or, you know, whether this is just part of the game. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's normal. How much do you think like that, that level of lack of experience is informing, you know, what might happen now and whether things will continue to go down because people are freaking out? Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. Um, you know, it, it can take um, LPs historically have often signed on for firms for kind of a three three fund tour with a with a sort of group mm -hmm. of key partners, mm -hmm. um, and so 
that second fund, you know, you need to be really showing some some results. And then that third fund, you know, they really want to be the big winner. And then it's like kind of emotionally they they reassess the relationship. Um, but often, you know, it is kind of a three fund cadence. And so I think um, if you're in that second to third fund cycle right now, uh, th- they're wanting to see that some of that liquidity, right? And I think that's that that's also tough when obviously no tech company wants to go public right now. Right. Right. Well, that, the, that's I interesting. The, Wait, actually, Eric was I, saying this on his podcast that it's the, been the longest since there's been an IPO in, in yeah. ages. Yeah. I mean, it's just obvious, right? Like we were, think about all the companies last year we were talking about could go public this year. Um, right. And now it's like maybe next year. And if, and if you're a private company looking at the bloodbath that you guys were talking about earlier, like why in their right mind would they want to join that? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, I, I, I remember saying at some point last year when the SPAC boom was happening that like it was taking out an entire generation, an entire cohort. And by taking out, I mean, you know, in a positive way, getting them to public markets, getting them liquidity events. Do you, do you think that maybe that's part of it too? Is that like we front loaded in the same way that, <laughs> In the same way that COVID times front loaded all of this growth for specific companies, like last literally a year ago, all the SPAC business that the markets being to the moon um, sort of cleared the decks. And so now people are looking around and, you know, God forbid you didn't get to go public. You didn't reach public markets, but like maybe this cohort, it's going to take some time for healthier, more mature companies to 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 reach that stage. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think if I'm the CFO of a growth stage company right now, I'm probably looking at the metrics very differently um, in terms of profitability than I was before. Because as we talked about with, you know, are these SaaS companies kind of the canary in the coal mine with their valuation multiples? You know, I think if you're if you're going to be identified as a so-called high high growth stock, um, what does that mean for you, right? Like, I, I think it was Trace Cohen tweeted that in January, Square bought Afterpay for twenty-eight billion dollars, and a firm has been trading around four or five billion. Yeah. This week. Oh god! <laughs> like that's insane, right? <laughs> like, oh my god! Well, don't even let's not even get into whether or not the uh, the Twitter deal <laughs> is going to blow up because what would Twitter's price be right now today? Um, let, uh, let, let's let's end this conversation with this question. Let's bring it back to most of the people listening to this are, are, are um, workers, devs, uh, engineers, people in the trenches at tech companies. Um, uh, I, I don't remember if we asked, asked Eric about this, but um, Alex, are you hearing rumors of layoffs and hiring freezes at the moment? You know, we... There have been a few that have been publicized and my team is, you know, kind of asking that very question. We are, we are looking around right now. I, I still feel like it is kind of a, things are happening at the margins where the top, the top 10% of low burn companies or kind of like extra, extra hot companies are still raising these crazy up rounds like rippling this morning. Um, and they're not being affected. And then the bottom 10% of highest burn companies are freaking out. I think for people listening who are at kind of the middle pack companies, like, yes, your company will probably raise at a lower valuation. No, I don't think you should be absolutely panicking that the company won't be able to raise at all. And so if you if you have a long-term conviction in the company, this is just going to probably cost your, you know, the value of your shares maybe a year of time or something, which of course sucks. But like, I don't think we're in that panic mode yet. Of course, stay tuned. Like, you know, if there are a bunch of high profile layoffs at so-called healthy companies, that would, or at least companies that are not considered high burn type companies, that would be a whole different kettle of fish. So I have, I have um, one more yeah, actually, um, just in terms of the advertising space, like it feels like that's a, a headwind that is part of this soup of things that are you know going on. You know, there's a lot of st- things happening like in the world, but structurally, fundamentally, advertising has been so important for a lot of these hyper growth companies, either participating as advertisers or as building their business around advertisers. Is that a factor in this mix right now? You know, especially with what's gone on with. Um, you know, app tracking, transparency, changes for Facebook's marketplace, et cetera. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm less of an expert there, except to, that I work at a company that depends. Exactly. Well, that's kind of why I wanted to ask you. <laughs> I know that I know that my marketing colleagues are still going to Cannes in, in a few <laughs> weeks, so that, okay. that hasn't been canceled, right? But I, but I do think that um, broadly speaking, pricing pressures there will will kind of have this trickle down effect. I just think it will take longer. I think that right now the market. The volatility in the market and what's happening, whether you're a crypto or, or a public tech company, is just moving way faster than like people's budgets. So I think like a couple months into a reset in the market, we can start talking about that. But I feel like that's kind of like a a real next order concern compared to like just this musical chairs happening right now, driven by you know everyone checking their accounts and freaking out. You know, and Coinbase yep. Uh, yep. having to say, "Hey guys, we're not going bankrupt." You know, never. Good <laughs> yeah. do don't right? <laughs> please don't take your crypto out. It's not a good idea. Exactly. No, just leave it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Brian. Yeah, uh, Alex, we're gonna we're gonna pivot to the last ten or fifteen minutes, and we're gonna do a little bit on Google I/O, and then pour one out for the iPod. So you're welcome. Please stick around for that if you want. If you want to, we're literally gonna share our first bump, iPod bump story. me, bump me back to the pack, and I will gladly listen. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, b- b- before you go, please uh, plug whatever you want, and, and thanks for coming on stage. Yeah, I would say um, I have a few. Fun big stories about some of these unicorn unicorn type companies still coming in the next few weeks. So if you want to get this heat check, just keep watching what I write about because we'll see. So yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, thank you, thanks, Alex, Alex. Uh, for, for for jumping up. Um, so uh, Chris, did you even get a chance to listen to uh, my mad? eight and a half minute rundown of IO. I, I did not, honestly. Uh, yes. Please. I mean, if it was only eight minutes, give me the 45 second version. Oh, it, it, <laughs> well, it was the usual in terms like, of like, were you, were you surprised? Like what, what's the high level takeaway emotion? Well, I, I do. Be, okay. Be so I do have a couple things that I want to point out, but yeah. you know, okay. this, the, this one is the hardest one for me at, with the caveat being that when, when, when Amazon does their, Yearly, here's all the hardware shit that we're going to do, and they yeah. announce 80 different things. That's that's worse, but yeah, um, it, it, it it's all. It, uh, if I can find a good piece to summarize what I think is, you know, Google's overarching um, sort of move towards, you know, what what their product vision is, um, I'll share that tomorrow, and, and maybe some thoughts on that. But uh, two things that did catch my eye that I wanted to talk about. Because there will be no real way to do it tomorrow. Um, the, the the Apple Watch, or not the Apple Watch, <laughs> <laughs> the Google Watch, um, seriously integrating. Um, um, uh, what's the company that they acquired? Uh, Fitbit. Fitbit, yeah, and all that stuff. Um, like they they didn't give a lot of details on that, but some of the reporting subsequently has been that it's it's. It was largely the design was led by the Fitbit team, hmm. so it's going to come with health and sleep tracking software. And so the question will be: to what degree, when when they do a full launch on this, will they attempt to leapfrog um, what the Apple Watch is right now? Like, um, it's always curious to me how Google puts the pedal to the metal and then pulls back in their competition. You know, especially with the Pixel phones, but now if they're if they're going to go into wearables, which you would think they're going to do because of the the Fitbit acquisition, and by going into this watch, it's a good looking watch from everything that we've seen. It's um, round, it, so it's round, which you know, it's, you know it's a that's a differentiator right there. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, the other thing that I thought was super interesting, which I did say, um, I did manage to get into the show today is the sort of groundwork that they're laying for um, uh, AR, not AR and VR, specifically AR, okay? Yep. yep. Um, and it made me think, and maybe I'll write up uh, a, a rant on this that'll be mo- more coherent than what I'm going to do right now, but um, in a way, Google is the best position company to win in AR, which is ironic given the whole ha-ha Google Glass shit. Uh-huh. But because they have the information layer in the real world more than anybody else, mm-hmm. and and when you and 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 I would argue that like saying "Hey Google" is way more you're more likely to get meaningful information out of doing that than saying "Hey yeah. Siri" or or, or Alexa. True. Yep. Um, that one of the things that they showed one of the demos was someone wearing 
you know, because as we've said, the, the ultimate form factor of AR glasses are glasses, the size, weight, and general shape of just regular glasses, right? Yeah. So they were showing a demo of being out in the real world and people uh, um, meeting each other on the street, speaking different languages, and in real time being able to communicate, and it's just nothing. Right. And yep. like that is that is the use case. Not having dragons appear on your <laughs> coffee table and play. I mean, that's fun and stuff like that. But it 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 reinforced to me that I do think that AR being the next thing can happen in this decade and can be meaningful. And there there's all sorts of other things that yeah, they introduced to go. So. Yeah. Right, right, right. But there's other things that they 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 demoed or or at least teased in terms of like the Apple Maps stuff that they can do and stuff like that. Like what it made me think of, and 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 I'll I'll pause after this so that you can share your mm-hmm. thoughts. But um, the the actual efficacy of being in the real world with AR is it is it, it's the true sense of wearable computing. Where the difference is, we've got all of these computers in our pockets, but we have to pause and, okay, open the phone, bring it up to my face, find the app, do the thing. And so that is the key. That's the thing that when, when someone can crack that, mm-hmm. where it's, you don't, you don't have to do the thing because it is overlaid across your real time life as you're experiencing it. That's actually, it, it, I, 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 I knew that that was the promise of it, but it reinforced to me that that is possible. And that is, that is maybe closer than certainly the fucking metaverse. Um, so hmm. thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I, just on your last point, you, you had me all the way up into the end, which is oh, interesting. And I, I suppose it's because when I think of the metaverse, it's, it's some, something of a, um, arbitrary delineation between what happens kind of in what you might imagine as like a Fortnite, you know, immersive okay. VR space versus augmented reality. I mean, uh, I, I, I can answer a couple this. tweets. Uh, what? I, I can answer this with what <laughs> the definitional difference is in my mind. Uh, okay. Tell me to, to me, the metaverse is different than Meatverse. The metaverse is a different hmm. world. Uh, like with different zip codes and addresses or it's, it's it's jacking in as going back to neuromancer. It is you're leaving the, to me. Yeah, no, I are. Yeah. I I think this is like the, like an arbitrary distinction. I understand Mm. what you're saying. And I, I also kind of want to maybe draw the distinction between uh, like immersion and extroversion, you know, being out in the world and being able to interact with and being partial. Like I would say that, when I'm cooking dinner and I have my AirPods in, I'm sort of in an augmented reality. It's, it's, it's immersive, but I'm certainly mm. able to interact with, you know, the meat space as you're suggesting. I, I don't have a headset, you know, an Oculus or anything like that or a metal quest. <clears throat> but when I'm sort of jacked into my matrix, which is a two dimensional surface, which is my, you know, Apple Pro XDR display, that is a view that I'm fully immersed in and I'm, you know, there I'm surfing the internet. I'm in email and Slack. Like these are two dimensional surfaces that are sort of a version of a metaverse, which is not super immersive. So that would be the, the spectrum that I'd be looking at or considering. And the glasses, what's interesting about them is that they are blending worlds in a novel, I guess, nexus between the way that you normally live your life the way that you typically will, you know, pull out your phone or look at, you know, glance at your um, wrist to see your watch and get information. Well, overlaying information directly onto your eyes just removes that um, that but context see, switch. It, it, this it, this is debatable, but this is where we differ. Definitionally, yep. uh-huh. I think of AR as cyborg stuff. To me, cyborg means hmm. you're augmenting your body in the real world. It's, it's, it's lick, lick lighters, uh, 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 mm-hmm. man, computer symbiosis versus definitionally. When I think of the metaverse, I'm thinking of leaving your body behind your body. I mean, I am quite disembodied when I'm like, you know, really working in and flow mm. on my computer. So again, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I think that in some ways, almost like the sci-fi has polluted like your ability to kind of see these things on a continuous spectrum, as opposed mm. to being like two separate worlds where you completely, where all the gravity is different and the way that you interact is different. You still, so much of what Zuckerberg talks about with what he's building with meta and the metaverse, 
are affordances that come from the real world. So mm. he's attempting to try to recreate the way in which we navigate, navigate and, and move and understand and feel and touch and all the emotions that happen in meat space in a virtual space. Why? Because it's disorienting to be in a digital space where those, you know, where that scaffolding of experience doesn't exist. So glasses seem to be, again, kind of trying to bridge the divide and the form factor has been the problem. Like to your point about Google IO, the fact that Google Glass had a lot of the, maybe the information primitives, uh, you know, 10 years ago, but didn't have the form factor right, is the journey that so many big tech companies are on. How do you miniaturize and shrink down the size of the computing platform so you can fit it on someone's head, it doesn't get too hot, it can be used for several hours, and it's kind of, it provides you with in-context information overlays that, again, obviate the need to pull out a device that is inconvenient or hard to operate with your fingers. Well, and I mean, maybe we're we're arguing different sides of the same thing because mm-hmm. what, what I want to express that you know the IO keynote reiterated to me when you say that you are fully immersed in your um, your Apple display mm-hmm. and like so you and and when you're in in on your uh, AirPods like you're immersed you're immersed. What it reinforced to me was that we haven't done as much work in the in the meat space computing stuff right in the same way that we didn't know how useful really it was to have a computer in your pocket so that computing left the desk and it went around with you in real life is the is the babblefish the example that you're kind of thinking about when you think of meat space computing like the translation i'm thinking of i'm thinking of of the ability you know they were they were doing things like um you look at like you apparently you can do this now with your phone like you can scan um uh the world around you and it's like what is this flower or like books on a shelf yeah like google lens kind of contextually phone so google lens is moving beyond text and things like that right so Essentially, Actually, I, I just noticed, sorry, uh, a sequitur, but if you go to Google Photos, if you have the Google Photos app, and I'm an iOS user, so maybe this has been mm-hmm. the case on Android for a while, but now Google Lens is part of the experience. So you can literally take a photo that you've taken and use the photo as a search input in Google Lens. So you can take a photo of someone, you know, I take a photo of you, for example, and I put it into Google Lens, and it'll find all the photos that are that have things detected in that photo in my photo library. Right. Now, now imagine doing that in real time in the exactly. real world. That's and Google saying. has been on And it's this, personalized to you. And it's personalized to you and they have been on the ambient computer stuff. Yep. Um, and so even even the even the promise of like voice activated personal assistants, yep. which again, Apple is bay fucking behind on <laughs> that sort of shit. Like so it made me realize I, I used to feel I feel like five or six years ago I felt this way about Google that they were um, the best positioned for the future, and then it never sort of panned out, and and so it sort of sparked that in me again, because I can see a world where if I've got their glasses on and I'm walking down the street, and sure I can ask questions um, with my voice and things like that, but also it is sort of the ambient computing stuff where they would know where I was going. They're they're talking about like. Well, we're reaching a point where the, the, the TV, you don't have to hit a button. It knows because you stood up, it's going to immediately pause your Netflix show and mm. stuff like that. It's like, I, I do think that there, and, and we can end it here and let's, let's end with the, um, the, the iPod stuff. But uh-huh. yep. I'm just, I, I was, hey, Google, you did your job. I, I, the spark was relit and I uh, regained some faith in, in your vision. I see. So, so it was inspirational. It wasn't just kind of like a grab bag of like new feature updates and, you know, oh, it was. devices. Well, it, it was, was, but there was something more. <laughs> no, it, it was, but okay. um, they, they didn't have a headline grabbing thing like they did two or three years ago with that sort of um, uh, calling into a, a 1-800 oh, number. A virtual, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh God. What was it? What called? was it called? Yeah, um, I can't remember. It was during the whole conversational <laughs> commerce, th- you know, moment. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. nothing like that, but um, it did. Uh, their overall vision, like I said, re-inspired me. So, okay, um, Great. let's let's end. Uh, I said on the show today, which you haven't heard, that isn't it funny how <laughs> Apple always manages to make headlines around anything Google does. Um, and one of the things, conveniently, that they did was uh, force everyone like me to talk about how um, the the iPod has reached the end of its of its tether, of its life um, as a product line. 
And I made the point on the show today that um, you can argue that, you know, there were Palm Pilots. You can argue that, of, of course, there were other MP3 players previous. You could argue that the Game Boy was a computer in your pocket. But in the 80s and 90s, Gadgets that were in your pocket were not necessarily computers. Computers were on your desk or your lap. And what I think the iPod did was usher in the modern era of gadgetry where gadgets were computers, whether it be the size of a paperclip or it, it, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the modern gadget began with the iPod and that doesn't even get into design and culturally what it did in terms of music and things like that. So, um, you know, I just wanted to mark that, uh, uh, pour one out for, for the iPod and ask you, Chris, uh, what was your first iPod? Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I often don't have time to sit down for breakfast. Between getting the kids out the door in the morning to starting to write this show, with one delicious scoop of AG1, though, I'm absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things. I need to hydrate every morning anyway, so instead of a tall glass of juice filled with sugar, I get a tall glass of water and mix AG1 into it. AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while still tasting good. It costs you less than $3 a day, so you're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. AG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash ride. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash ride to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. As a small business owner, you're probably juggling a hundred balls in the air and you don't have time to interview candidates who just aren't qualified for your role. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier for you to find the people you want to interview faster and for free. LinkedIn has always found us hires easily and quickly, and you can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 770 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash ride. That's linkedin.com slash ride to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Oh, man, my first iPod. Um, you know, I think actually it was a, an iPod Nano. It was red. Um, I think it had a 128 gigabytes of memory, maybe. Um, I remember, like, to go way back, I had a Diamond Rio. Do you remember that? It was like a round little For player. sure. I had yeah. one. And oh, I'll tell man. you, not to, not to interrupt your your story, yeah. but um, because I was not a Mac person in those days, when Same. when the Same. when the iPod came out in two thousand one, I was so jealous of it. I found an equivalent which was called the Rio Riot, oh. which allowed I think thirty thirty megabytes. Yeah, kidding. right. <laughs> well, no, or whatever it was, but like it was, it had a larger size storage than, than the iPod. I'm sure someone will look this up and correct me, sure. but then also it was like three times the size of it. So I remember, because I remember going for a run on nine 11. Mm. Um, so this, because the iPod didn't come out till October, but I had this before the iPod came out and it was like a good three pound thing. And I would have to hold it in my hand. If anyone looks it up, it was a big (laughs) MF. It's like one of those Um, bones. (laughs) And then, and then the iPod came out and I was like, God damn it. That's the size of a, Mm -hmm. of a pack of playing cards. And that's a lot better. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't, I wasn't an Apple person at that point. So, you know, I will say just to, to build on what you're saying, 
you know, so many of Apple's inventions have and, and innovations have really been about removing, if not the mystique of technology and computing, but to make it one, you know, fit in your hands Two, make it not feel really like technology, you know, especially like with a click wheel and just the ability for direct manipulation. You know, the funny thing um, I, I, I um, was quoted in a, in a source for an information piece about TikTok uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I was using the phrase information waterboarding, which is kind of the consensual experience of, you know, being inundated with videos and content for hours and hours, you know, without even thinking about it. And the reason why TikTok works so well is because unlike with Instagram, where you're scrolling through the feed, at least when it was um, static photos, you kind of do this like flick motion where you like flick up and then pause with your thumb and flick up and pause and flick up and pause. And that is how you would consume the feed on Instagram. And TikTok sort of ingeniously decided to kind of remove the pause uh, action of your thumb and allow you to just swipe up and then it stops the content, you know, fills the screen and then you swipe up again. And that little removal of friction seems to be such a huge and important aspect of the TikTok experience. And if you think back to the first iPod and the, the click, the click wheel and the ability to sort of like move through thousands upon thousands of items where previously you were tapping a button like up and down to go between folders or whatever types of, you know, directory structure there was, the efficiency of that interface again, made it feel magical, made it feel like it wasn't technology, made it feel like you mm -hmm. weren't stupid or slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing to keep remembering about how those iterations in hardware design enabled more and more generations of consumers to adopt and bring technology into their, their lives in ways that previously, like you said, like that brick, like it just, there's people who would be like, mm, it's, it's too heavy. It's too bulky. I don't like it. Like it just, it feels gross. Well, so, also how much, how much, and, and, and the, the, um, the Walkman, the Sony Walkman yep. captured this as well. How much bringing your personal music with you, oh, man. Yeah. again, this is coming back to our previous conversation into the real world, yeah. like bringing your personality with you into the, you know, on a train, uh, going for a walk with your dog. By the way, I, I brought up uh, Wikipedia, the rail riot ship in 2002. So I wasn't listening to that on nine 11. It was mm. probably my diamond rail, but, um, and by the way, it had 20 gigabytes of storage. Okay. So um, still mm -hmm, good amount. But the other thing is that I was thinking about the I, iPod today is how how apocal it seemed, how big it seemed, and how quickly, like literally, it's it's an app now. It's it's Spotify, right? The the whole idea of music and and tying into hardware and things like that is just an app now, and it's a it's a subscription that you pay every month. Mm, and mm. it's weird to think about how things like the MP3 and, and MP3 players blew up a, a $20 billion a year industry. Um, and, well, and not just now, that, but actually, you know, to think about, I think the, the, what you're pointing out, and it's interesting to think about this, like when we think about the internet and the purpose, uh, at least for many of us, of democratizing media and allowing anybody to publish and consume, you know, Steve Jobs had the idea that people needed to own their music. You know, like you wanted your record collection, you wanted your yeah. CD collection, you, you wanted to burn those CDs onto your computer and to own them and to have them. And we did. And we did. We wanted and, that. Absolutely. But over time, with the creator economy, we've actually eroded kind of the, the, the middle person purpose of record labels and whatnot and how they were necessary to distribute content because you had to put it on physical media to now where anybody can produce songs and produce music. And so it was impossible to ever get enough you know, CDs or content that way. And so that is why it has become a service. I mean, Spotify is just a browser that surfaces, that surfs the music web. And mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. no way that, you know, at least as, if you see that the power and the inclusivity of the web as a platform, you know, that, that iTunes would have remained the only way to get your music for a dollar 29 a piece forever. At least it seems to me. I, I do. I still have, you've been to my house. I still have bookshelves yes. everywhere. I know. Um, mm -hmm. I, when we, we cleaned out Lisa's um, storage unit in Ann Arbor last year, we, got rid of my 400 CDs that would have been on the walls. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. I, I, I do, I do miss the ownership. Yeah. Um, well, I mean the physicality, right? Yeah. I and, miss and, that. Yeah. Hmm, hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, we could, we could keep going on this for a while, but 
you know, we've probably, uh, yes, yes, yes. We let's, started let's in a very interesting place and we're back to optimism. So, so I appreciate that we can continue to, to have that conversation even during this bloodbath. Yes, indeed. And uh, thanks to all of our guests. Thanks to everyone that's listening. Um, and uh, anyone that is listening that's not familiar with the show, this will go up on the Tech Meme Ride Home feed on Saturday if you want to listen back. Um, and uh, let's, have a, let's have a better week next week, uh, tech <laughs> <Please>. industry. <laughs> all right. If not, we'll, we'll be here again, you know, and we'll talk indeed, about it then. Indeed. All right, everybody. All right. Later, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Ciao. 